This is, this is, this is. Welcome to a brand new episode of the Mike Herrera Podcast. I got a great episode for you. Chris Knuckles Nylon, he's a hockey legend, NHL, Montreal Canadiens, won the Stanley Cup, was an enforcer. Um, he now has his own podcast. He, we're going to talk all about it in just a minute. Before we get to that, MXPX, new song out, Set a Fire, just came out uh, last Friday. So go add it to your music library. Go watch the video on the MXPX YouTube We'd appreciate that. MXPX.com for all of your needs. We got merch up there, but please go check out Set of Fire. Let me know what you think. Hit me in the comments on the My Career Podcast Facebook section or any anywhere. MXPX comments, that'd be great. Tag MXPX. All of that would be amazing. Now, Chris actually did a collab with us. He filmed a little a little video of him lighting a fire, and we added that to the some promo stuff we did for the it was last week just cool for him to do and it's amazing to have him on this podcast because he has truly a, an amazing story his life has been nothing short but legendary and uh so glad that he's come through and he's still doing exciting things working on a, a one-man spoken word show possibly a movie so there's a lot going on we're going to get into it right now so here's chris nyland all right, cool. Well, Chris, dude, thank you so, <laughs> sir. Thank you. I'm. I mean, uh, I don't get legends too often on this this podcast from the NHL. So, yeah, and legend, legend. I guess for me is, um, I don't know. I just people. I hear it. They use, oh, you're a legend and this and that. But I, I, I never feel comfortable with it. Right. I listen. I know I played the game at a high level for a long time, and I did my job, but. I, I hear that at times, and it's just kind of like, hello. Uh, my, my father always told me, keep your feet planted firmly on the ground, son. Don't ever let all this stuff go to your head. And uh, quite frankly, it didn't. But yeah, yeah. So legend, I appreciate it. Um, but again, I, I, I guess I'm a little uh, uncomfortable when I hear that, um, that term used with my name. Yeah, well... I know it's hard to come to terms with something, but you are a legend. And for those that don't know, and I'd love you to get into your story, but Chris Knuckles Nyland, he was known as an enforcer. He was the enforcer for the Montreal Canadiens, fiercely loyal to the club. You got traded a few times. Maybe we'll talk about that. But I just, I just love that that you've had such an insane career. And, and we were talking a little bit earlier about how. They're developing a movie for you. I actually watched your documentary, The Gladiators. Um, Gladiators was so good, so much heart, so much grit. Uh, tells the story perfectly. People, honestly, you don't even need to listen to this podcast. You can go watch yeah. Gladiators. But <laughs> but yeah. I, I'd love to hear a little bit about your story so people could kind of catch up. Yeah. Well, yeah, you know, I grew up in Boston, uh, in the city, and I uh, – I got into hockey at a young age, you know, um, and the Bruins were a big, um, <clears throat> you know, big hit in Boston in, in that era, Bobby Orr and the Bruins. And um, I certainly loved the game. I loved skating. They built uh, a rink at the end of my street in Boston uh, with the idea of trying to keep kids off the streets, give them an opportunity to do something other than hang around the street corner. And I was fortunate enough to have that rink right at the end of my street. I could walk to it. So I started public skating there for a long time. Then they started a hockey league. And um, that's how I got involved in the game. I, um, I, I guess as far as the, the game did a whole, oh, uh, a whole, oh, sorry. That's all right. <laughs> it's real life right the there. Game did a whole lot of good for me. At a young age. So the game, so they built a rink at the end of the, the street. At my street. And, you know, that's where I started skating. Then I started um, playing in a house league there. Then eventually um, I moved up uh, Pee Wee Bantam levels. And then uh, I ended up playing with a kind of an all star team from kids from all around the ne neighborhoods uh, of the city of Boston called the Hub City, was the name of the team. And um, I had come in contact with the coach there <clears throat> who was a judge and he 
uh, ended up having a really profound influence on my life, a huge influence on my life, actually. Um, and uh, yeah, I just took a liking to the game. I loved it. Uh, I played, a, I was an aggressive player and I, I grew up certainly watching the Bruins. That's the way they played. Um, I was always kind of aggressive uh, on the streets, you know, hanging around with my friends. Whatever we did, I was kind of a guy that uh, always stuck up for my friends, my family members, whatever. And, uh, you know, that, those things were kind of instilled in me from my dad. You know, he was a Green Beret. Uh, he, he was uh, another fiercely loyal to family and, and friends and his country. And uh, a lot of that rubbed off on me. Wow. So you're, you're known for fighting in the league. You were known as, you know, an enforcer. Which, honestly, like, as a newer hockey fan, we just got a hockey team a couple years ago, Seattle Kraken. Yeah. I'm from the Seattle area. And yeah. so, uh, you know, I grew up watching a few hockey games, but not, nothing like you were immersed in it, you know. So, was hockey was just, fighting was ingrained in hockey back in those days, right? Yeah. And, and were you a fighter before you were even a hockey player? What, what happened first? Well, the fighting happened first <laughs> on the street. Yeah, <laughs> um, that's where I learned to fight. Listen, my dad was a stern disciplinarian. Um, I got in some trouble growing up as a kid, and uh, my dad always disciplined me with his his hands. Um, you know, at the time, I I despised it. I hated it. I hated that he was physical with me. But when I look back. Today, um, I won't say I needed that kind of disciplining, but it worked to some extent for me because I was an unruly kid. Um, I was kind of wild, and um, he, you know, he thought that was going to keep me in line, and it really didn't. Um, but the fighting in the streets was where it started, and then when I played – High school hockey, I played college hockey. I never fought, right? You couldn't fight on the ice then. If you did, I had one fight in college, and I got suspended two games for it. And uh, when I turned pro, uh, I got sent to the minor leagues. My first um, year, I had a ten, a five-game tryout my first year with Montreal. I didn't sign a contract. I was such a late uh, draft pick. And the reason for that was Judge King, my coach, um, was friends with one of the scouts, the Montreal Canadiens. And he got them to draft me. And I was drafted really late. Uh, I was the 231st pick that year in the draft. There were 234 players taken that year. So I <laughs> was at the very – it was a favor. Yeah, and yeah. Anyway, like, come on. Well, I get my foot in the door. Yeah. I don't have a contract because I'm such a late draft pick, and they didn't expect me to make it. So I went to Nova Scotia. I had that five-game tryout in the American Hockey League. Um, and my first game I played in was in Maine. And that was Philadelphia's farm team. And that Philadelphia, the Broad Street Bullies, always had a reputation of having tough guys who could fight. And the first game I played, I ended up fighting the toughest guy on their team, and I cut him open. Uh, and I hurt him pretty good. And... I think I surprised a lot of people because me, I was six feet. He's six. Uh, Glenn Cochran was probably six, four, you know, two twenty five, big kid. Yeah. And uh, they're thinking I'm just a college kid. They always looked at college kids or American kids as pussies, quite frankly. And um, I had hit him and he turned around and slashed me. I slashed him back. We dropped our glove. Anyway, I cut him open pretty good. We got kicked out of the game. The next day, um, the coach called me. He said, uh, hey, Chris, come down and see me in my room at the hotel. And I said, sure. And I thought, this is how naive I was at the time. I thought he was having me down the room because I was going to get sent down even lower to the minor leagues because I got kicked out of the game. I yeah. thought he was mad at me, right? <laughs> so I come in the room. And he says, hey, um, do you have an agent? And I said, no, I don't have an agent. He said, well, you better get one. He said, Montreal wants to sign you a contract. I had one fight with one of the toughest guys in the league, 
And that's how I got my first contract. And once I beat that guy, right, that word traveled around the league that this new kid in Nova Scotia, Nyland, did this to Cochrane. So every team I played against, their tough guy wanted to challenge me. And it was like, so I played 49 games there. Now, I could play the game, too. Like, you know, I grew up wanting to be Bobby Orr. Yeah. You know, quite frankly, I didn't have the talent to be Bobby Orr, but that's what I aspired to do. I, think- I wanted to be a, a good hockey player, score goals, do yeah. all that. Well, in those fifteen ga- uh, those 49 games, I had 15 goals and 10 assists. I had 25 points in 49 games. That's a point every two games. For a tough guy, that's huge. That's huge. But yeah. That one fight, um, everybody in the league challenged me. So in those 49 games, I had 304 penalty minutes in 49 games. If I played all 80 down there, I probably would have ended up with like 600 minutes, like insanity. But, <laughs> you know, I fought. I literally fought my way to the NHL. I played those 49 games, and uh, the Canadians – uh, called me up in January, and I never went back. Um, I stayed in the NHL uh, till the day I retired. So, um, you know, and it it all started with that one fight with Cochran. And uh, once I had that reputation, man, you got to show up every night because someone's going to be gunning for you. <laughs> yeah, what's that feeling of of you know people are out to kick your ass? Like they're they're out to get you. Is that a does that do you get used to that after a while in the league? Yeah, you know, <laughs> I, I, a lot of people ask me questions about how I did it and did you like it? Uh, you know, a lot of guys say they didn't like it. It was tough on them. They couldn't sleep. They couldn't. I slept like a baby. I love my job. <laughs> I love sticking up for my teammates. No, I'm not going to sit here and tell you, oh. I wasn't scared of anybody. Listen, I had nerves like anybody. You mm-hmm. you feel it. You know it's coming. Um, you know, I was able to walk through that fear and, and, and confront whatever I had to confront at the time. And, you know, whether it was, you know, being challenged by a tough guy who wanted to fight me and me accepting it or me stepping in to protect a smaller teammate or any teammate uh, for that fact and uh, just do the job that that got me to the NHL. And what kept me there is I was able to do that consistently uh, whenever it was needed. But what really kept me there and allowed me to, to do that job was that I was also able to play. And, you know, when you have a tough guy that's able to play also, that's just a luxury for teams. And uh, mm-hmm. the Canadians... Uh, you know, I, I don't want to sound cocky saying it, but it was a luxury to have me because they didn't have to sit me on the bench. They didn't want me to be that guy, oh, you go fight, um, and then sit me on the bench. And matter of fact, I could have never done that job if I went out and fought and then I sat on the bench the rest of the game. It, it wouldn't have worked with me. Yeah. So that drove me even more to um, work hard and develop my skills to the point where I became an everyday NHL player. I had help doing it, but uh, that was my, honestly my, my my proudest accomplishment as far as hockey. Yeah, winning the Stanley Cup was awesome. It, it was the best, but becoming an a everyday NHL player where I played, that was huge. Yeah. I think that honestly, I, I I can relate to that as a musician. Once I got to a certain level, playing with other great bands, bands that I thought were great, I felt like okay, I'm I'm doing this. I'm I'm an actual working musician. I'm, this is my career. So I, I could see how like that. That's all we ever want as as Ooh. as fighters. As what you know, whatever you call it. Like we're all fighting to get something, right? But. Yeah. Um, yeah, to, to just be part of, of that, you know, elite club, whatever that is. And, and I don't mean to say club because, you know, but, but uh, I, you know, I want to know, I want to know what it was like for you, um, you know, just playing, like how, how often, like, were you going to bed? I know you said you slept well, but like, 
did you have like bruises constantly? Like you just learned to sleep through the pain. <laughs> let me get rid. Of it. Yeah, yeah. Let me let me get rid. Of it. Barry, I. Oh. Because like for me as a musician, sure, it's I'm not getting punched. I'm not getting thrown down on the ice. But like after hours and hours on stage, sometimes you get these bruises. You get sore. I've had both ankles cracked on stage on one show you know i'm just like oh great i'm limping to the hotel room that night and that's nothing compared to what you probably have gone through so what was what was some of those hard nights well you know for sure my hands were like cut up all the time you know it's not like you know, you're on the road, you go for dinner, you got a suit on and you walk in, you got a black eye and your hands are all cut up and the waitress is looking at you. Who's this guy? Yeah. Who, you know, is this a businessman who, you know, got in a fight last night, uh, you know, on the road or whatever? It was, it, it, it's just funny, the looks you would get from people, especially if they had a suit on, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I had a, a lot of nights, I had hunks of skin, you know, I had to bite off my hand and, Cause you know, you hit helmets and stuff like that. And that my that, hand was sore a lot. And, yeah. That's what I'm always thinking know. when I'm watching you punch people, when I'm watching just hockey players get in fights, they're punching helmets. They're, pun you know, it's just like, what is going on? Like constantly. Yeah. And I'm just looking at my hand going, this would be broken right now. If I did that. Uh, well, I broke a, a couple times, but you know, it, um, today it's a little different. They got the visors, but back in our day, you know, you, certainly could make contact with the face no problem uh there were times when you swung that you'd hit a helmet i started throwing up a cuts quite a bit because you know there's no helmet in the chin um and you know when you come over the top you have to have a well-aimed punch not to hit the helmet and there's times balance wise if you off balance you're getting tugged and pulled at the same time you know if you could keep your feet planted which i was pretty good at um and and keep that base then you were able to hang in there and do well and you know i i had the a lot of bumps and bruises and then you know my first eight years i really didn't get hurt and then i, I um ended up um when i say hurt a major injury i hurt i had a torn ligament in my knee which kept me out about six weeks uh six seven weeks and that was my first big injury and um, after I got traded from Montreal, um, they started to pile up yeah, big time when well, I was in New York. Yeah, I think well, I only played hockey once with some friends. Shout out John Reed. Shout out uh, Jim, James Stuckey. Uh, but it was so long ago, and I was so terrified of hitting the ice because I fell once, and it was the ice was so hard. I was just like, I couldn't believe how hard that ice was. And so, like, my whole thing was just like, don't fall down, don't die. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. you know, they, they always say, like, you know, players play injured a lot, and, yeah. and almost every player is, has something going on, right? So I always think as a, as a layman, somebody just that watches from the TV most of the time, like, how, how do you get through it? Is it adrenaline? Is it you have to be mentally ready to punch a helmet and not worry about it? Uh, is it, uh, do you get pumped up with some sort of steroid, some sort of, no, 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 you know, <laughs> um, say my hands will cut up or something. Everybody plays with a little nagging things, whether it's a bruise, you know, muscle pull something, but it's the major injuries that really can have an effect on you. But mm -hmm. everybody's always playing with something. And a lot of guys do that one, you know, that, you don't want to look like kind of a wimp with your teammates. Oh, you got a bruised shoulder. You got something going on. If you don't play, if you get that moniker of someone who doesn't play, you're going to hear it from your teammates, right? Mm -hmm. And you got to be willing to sacrifice for the team, the better of the team. And, and no one ever wants to get tagged with that. Like they always, Philadelphia was a tough team and, there was a real thing. It was called the Philadelphia flu. And there were guys <laughs> that when they came to Philly, all of a sudden they had a pulled groin or, Oh, I got, I can't play because it was a, 
a small rink with a lot of tough guys out there. That was scary. And a lot of guys got the Philly flu. They got it and when they went to Boston, too. But, you know, just say my hands were cut up or something one night. The adrenaline, yeah, gets you through. But then the game is over. Okay? And then it's ice packs and icing down. And then, you know, a couple of beers. A couple of beers. Um, <laughs> icing <laughs> from the inside out. And then, um, you know, you get up the next day and have to play again. And your hands are sore, but you put your skates on, the gloves on, you go back at it. And you learn to live with it and, you know, try and just uh, take care of those things as good as you can, you know, those injuries, um, you know, with the training staff or whoever, just so you're able to get out there and, and do it again on a, another night. Yeah. So you did something like every – player wants to win the big thing so you got the stanley cup right yeah. amazing congratulations um Thank you. and so it's like what's next you know what do you do after that you know you keep playing you keep fighting you keep going um and then you you end up i, I don't know we don't need to necessarily go all into your whole like end of your career you did get traded which has got to be the worst thing because yeah. you're so loyal to your team and then you get traded that's something that i can't relate to as a musician, because musicians aren't, we don't work like that. It's like you're in yeah. your band. You can get kicked out of your yeah. band. You can, <laughs> sure. Yeah. But usually there's no trading usually happening uh, in the same way. So it's something that it's just like foreign to me, how people trade. You got to go to a different city, yeah. show up, you know, back, you know, back to America, right? You went back to America. Yeah. But um, what was, what was that like? I guess, you know, is anything stick out in your mind? Um, getting traded, going to new cities. Yeah, I, I can tell you. Um, uh, first, I'll touch on the cup. Winning the Stanley Cup was incredible. And I'll tell you, it, it was the most difficult thing. I, I believe it's the most difficult trophy in sports to win. You know, you have to win four, um, seven, potential seven-game series, mm -hmm. okay, to get there. And uh, the physicality of it all, the the – the strain on the body, the mind, the mental part of it, it's incredible. But when we won it that year, we're like, okay, we'll be back here next year. Uh-uh. That's the biggest misnomer. It was so hard to get back there. I never did again. I was in the Stanley Cup final one time, and I was fortunate enough to be on a team we won it. Um, fast forward, a uh, year and a half later, I had an issue with uh, the coach who I, I said I'd never allow a coach to tell me to go to fight someone. And he made the inference uh, in front of the team that I wasn't fighting and uh, basically I should do it. And I had some words for him in front of everybody. Um, and um, I always said if I ever had a coach treat me like that, I knew how to do my job. I didn't have to be told. Um, I didn't have to be prodded into doing it. And uh, I would never respect the guy who told me to go fight. And he was going to hear it for me. Well, he did. And uh, I ended up getting traded because of it, my um, situation with the coach. The guy who traded me, Serge Savard, was a teammate at one time, uh, Hall of Famer. And we're still very good friends today. I love him to death. Uh, and he said in his book, uh, one of the worst moves he ever made was when he traded me. Now, I was so passionate about playing for the Montreal Canadiens. Uh, I loved the city. I loved the fan base. I loved everything about it. And when I uh, was traded, I was devastated. And it almost broke me. I didn't allow it to, but it almost broke me. Uh, I went to New York and I still did my job. I still protected my teammates. I still worked my ass off. But it was never the same playing for the Rangers or the Boston Bruins. Uh, I never, man, I love the Montreal Canadiens. I just, the passion I have, the connection I had. Uh, um, yeah. 
Yeah, and, and I, I love that you got traded back to the Montreal Canadiens and got to retire. Well, he brought me back, Serge, the guy who traded me, yeah. brought me back for a curtain call. And, you know, I probably could have got a job, maybe L.A., somewhere else in the league if I chased it. But once I came back and I played uh, that last half a season, Montreal didn't want to sign me again. I was 34 years old, which I understand. You, you're old at 34. That's so crazy. And, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I said, I'm not going to bother try. I was happy to retire as a Montreal Canadian. So, yeah, it was, it was awesome when I come back. It wasn't quite the same, but at least I was able to go out and go out on uh, terms that were just fine with me. Yeah. Yeah. So what what do you do then? I mean, you, you have a podcast. You, you yeah. know, um, is it the well, I struggled when I got out of the game. How hard is it to, like, all of a sudden, everything you've been living your whole life for about, now it's done. And you're, you're yeah. sitting there going, do I sell cars next? What do I do, right? <laughs> yeah, it sucks. You know, it was very difficult. I had a tough time with it. Um, I never quite found anything that could um, fill that big hole now mm -hmm. that I had here Yeah. from not being able to play the game. I Near the end, I, I got injured so many. I broke my arm twice. I had a hockey hernia. I had, you know, I had 11 surgeries on my knee, my right knee. Uh, eight of them were scopes. Um, but I, I, I was banged up at the end. And when I got out of the game, it was, you know, I healed up. I was starting to feel pretty good. And I struggled. You know, I got in the insurance business. I did a couple different things. Just nothing that ever really sat well with me. Yeah. Um, I went down a, a, a road that, uh, you know, you see it happen a lot of walks of life, whether you're an athlete, no matter who you are, um, people, for whatever reason, get uh, going down a path that um, brings you uh, uh, a lot of pain and suffering in your life. And that's what I ended up doing. Um, um, I never found anything that I was quite comfortable doing. I was terrible at sales uh i couldn't sell insurance i couldn't you know some people they can sell you know snow to the eskimos I, yeah you know what i'm saying i just could i could never and i struggled i went back to hockey at one point um i coached down in the east coast hockey league for two years um and uh, i got coached here my first year i was doing well and um that team moved uh and I almost had a job in Providence moving up to the next level. Uh, somebody else got that job. And then uh, I walked away and didn't stick with it. And, um, yeah, I, I really struggled. I coached at the NHL level for a year as an assistant, but um, I'm not a good assistant coach. <laughs> yeah. I know that. Yeah, I have to coach. they say yeah. And, the assistant yeah. Coach, the the assistant needs to coddle the players a yeah, little I'm bit not more. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah, not yeah. Happening. Something tells right. me you're going to tell it to him straight. Like, okay, this is what's happening. <laughs> yeah. So you know, I struggled, and then eventually, you know, surgery after surgery, I got addicted to pain medication, which took me down a bad road. Percocet, and then on to oxycotton, um, and then eventually heroin, and. Um, yeah, almost took my life, and I got sober and cleaned up in 2000. You know, I didn't – I was on the pills back then. It was the second time. I had relapsed, and I went back. It was the second time I got into the other stuff, which wasn't good. And, uh, you know, I got cleaned up, and uh, I had an opportunity back in um, 2011 to come here to Montreal to do a radio show on TSN. Uh, with English radio here in Montreal, kind of like ESPN in the States. Okay. And um, I had a, for 10 years, I had a really pretty popular um, radio show, sports radio, did really well and um, was doing it from home during the pandemic. And then it was time to go back in the studio and I ended up getting fired because I refused to get vaccinated. And, um, I ended up uh, starting my podcast, and that's where I'm at now. So uh, I'm glad I didn't get vaccinated. Yeah, d dude, seriously. Um, 
I love that you just ended up doing your own thing. You're like, okay, I'm, I'm going to do my thing. Yeah. Raw knuckles podcast. It's really fun. It's really cool. Um, it actually is getting me more into hockey too. You know what I mean? Cause hockey season just started. I'm like, I'm kind of ready for this is perfect timing talking to you, getting pumped on it. Yeah. Um, I don't, I don't assume that my team's going to be any good this year. Sometimes you have down years. Like how, how hard is it for a player to be playing for a losing team? Well, it's difficult. You know, when I, um, I was never really on a losing team. The worst team I was on was the first year I got to the Rangers. We were out of a playoff spot. We ended up battling back uh, to get within a point of the playoffs to the end of the season. But out of the 13 years I played, I only missed the playoffs once. So I've gone through situations where we weren't winning, and it really sucks. It is not fun. It's not fun going in the rink when you're in one of those funks. Uh, Seattle has played well. I mean, see, you know, expansion teams don't make the playoffs. It takes them years. Yeah. But they've already been there, you know, which is a, a testament to uh, certainly the organization of people who put it together, uh, management um, and staff. But, boy, um, you know, it's you make it there, it's great. The competition is so fierce, and there's 32 teams, 16 of them make it. 16 of clawing, scratching, digging, doing everything they can to get in. Yeah. The competition is incredible. So for an expansion team, and uh, they've really done well, and they're in a good place. And, you know, we'll see what happens this year. But, you know, another expansion team come in, and you, you know, Utah, not really, but they are somewhat. They moved uh, a young team, new town. But, you know, it's difficult. It's difficult for sure. And Seattle, what a place for a hockey team. I, I always wondered why you yeah. waited so long. Yeah, I, right? Like it's sh- that city. Yeah, so weird. Like the I loved seeing I love seeing the new expansion of, of hockey getting bigger, being more out there on in the in the mainstream on TV, more places to watch, easier to watch. Um I've gone to more hockey games in the last two years than my whole life combined before that. Just because we have now we have a hockey team, you know. So like I had yeah. gone to the I had gone to the Seattle Thunderbird, which is the minor league hockey. Yeah, I had gone to a few other things like a a, a Canadian minor league up up visiting my uncle, like a few things, you know. And I'd seen some fights, and it's so exciting. And but yeah, now that I now that we have a team, it is so much more enjoyable. I, I get more into paying more attention to the other teams. So uh, bravo, um, I'm stoked. So I love I, Seattle. Yeah. You know, I lived out there. I lived in Washington for a little bit when I got sober. I got sober in Astoria, Oregon. Uh, and yeah. then I lived in uh, Ilwaco. Ilwaco. Yeah, where is that? Is that on the, That's right on, in the west? That's right uh, Ocean View. Okay, so it's, in, it's right on, on the, the ocean. Coast. Yeah, the coast. Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah, and then I lived in Cannon Beach for a little bit. I stayed out there for a couple of years, but after a while... I couldn't take the rain. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. Well, I can't stand the rain on my windows. No. Yeah, <laughs> I can imagine right? too because I, uh, well, I grew up here, so I'm kind of used to the rain. But growing up, everybody always wanted to leave. I got to get out of this town. I got to get out of this town. And when we were able to because we became a touring band and, and started yeah. touring ac- across the world. But because we were touring and saw so many countries and so many cities, I could really appreciate my hometown and, and my home state um, for what it is, which is, hey, it's there's no no place like it. It's it's one of a beautiful. kind. Yeah, it's great. It's a beautiful city. Like, I absolutely loved it when I was there. I loved um, the, the layout of the city. It remind, listen, I grew up in Boston, another coastal city. Beautiful. I like being near the ocean, but just... Yeah, it was beautiful out there. I loved it. And, um, yeah, a cool city. And, you know, your band, like, all that traveling to – a lot of people never get out of that. Um, I I look at my friend. I was so fortunate to get out of Boston, right? And I look at – I go back now, and I see the same guys doing the same thing. (laughs) Never (laughs) left, right? And that's okay. That's okay. But having that opportunity to go, and like you with your band – MXPX to be able to go and travel the, the world like that's huge. Like I traveled all over the U.S. 
I've been to other places. I've been to Russia. I've been to Afghanistan. I've been uh, Britain, uh, the UK, stuff like that. And it's awesome to get out. But there's so much to do in our own country that, you know, like for the first time two years ago, I went to Yellowstone. Like, oh, hello. wow. Yeah. Yeah, which is incredible. Like, incredible. My wife is from um, the Big Island of Hawaii. And we, you know, I, We've been there quite a bit, and it's absolutely beautiful. But there's a lot to do here in our own country, and it's so cool. But, yeah, like with your band to get that opportunity um, to get out of your it, it really city, changed. It changed everything. Right? And, and you know, one of the one of the early places we went to was, was Quebec and Montreal. La Belle Province. You know, we got to try yeah. poutine, and, and, yeah. and it was so much fun. So I could, I could see how you fell in love with that city and that that country coming up from from being down here but um montreal is a place we're actually going to come so if we come to play montreal you got to come out and see us oh yeah that'd be amazing I will, for sure <laughs> for sure you know who um i i actually saw him out west uh dropkick murphy's kenny casey is a friend of mine yes and, ken i just saw those guys a couple weeks ago yeah yeah ken's a friend and uh when I was out getting sober, uh, I, I actually met up with him. Um, we, uh, we had a bite to eat and chatted. And then I went to his concert out there in, in Portland, actually. And then um, he comes up here, too. I saw him play up here. So, yeah, really cool. So you come to town. When are you coming? Do you know? Uh, I don't know, but I'm, I'm assuming we're going to come in 2025. So right. won't be cool. too long before, I mean, before we know it, we're going to hit next year. I mean, yeah. it's already almost Halloween and then it's going to be Thanksgiving, you know, all that. Do you do Thanksgiving up in Montreal a little different maybe? Yeah. Well, they do Canadian Thanksgiving. They just had it this past weekend and it's nothing like uh, Thanksgiving in the U S nothing at all. Yeah. Just, just no, a different thing. Close. Right on. Well, thank you so much for your time. Um, I know you're going to be doing, you're starting to do speaking. You're working on a show. Yeah, I'm actually, um, uh, Mike Tyson did the one man show. I have a guy here who was interested in doing it with me locally. And um, uh, we're just starting to put the story together now. And I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be 90 minutes we're looking at. Um, and, uh, yeah, yeah, I've told my story so many times, like w the book, uh, the Gladiators, the movie, um, and yeah. and we're just looking at a way to present it where it'll be certainly thought provoking, evocative, um, funny, you know, really, um, and you know, I've done a few speaking engagements now where I I've been able to offer that, which is fun. I enjoy doing it, so I'm really looking forward to that. And my friend, Barry Reese, who uh, helped me out with my podcast and also was the producer of The Last Gladiators, since we did that film, he's been trying to get a, a Hollywood version of my life story written. And he just not has given up. It's been 10 years. He's been banging away on this. So I've been talking to a writer out of L.A. and uh, we'll see where it goes. If it does, it does. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Um, we'll see. Your life is definitely a movie, my friend. And I think the more you do the spoken word stuff, that's going to that's gonna push that movie and build towards yeah. the momentum of getting that movie made, I think. Because I, I would love to see your spoken word. I would definitely come yeah. see it, start in theaters, do your thing. Like um, Then you're going to be like a touring musician like me. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see. We'll right see. on. Where can people find find you if they want to find your podcast and, and your socials? Well, the podcast's on everywhere. It's on um, uh, Spotify, YouTube, uh, anywhere you're listening to your podcasts. And then um, as far as my website, it's knucklesnylon.com. You can go there and it has, uh, you know, all my handles, Instagram, Twitter, all that X, we'll say, and Facebook. So, yeah, yeah. Um, knucklesnylon.com and it's the raw knuckles podcast raw knuckles podcast right on thank you so much um man i just can't believe we just did this thank you legend yeah. legend yeah hey no problem mike and listen when you come to montreal we'll definitely get together for sure i'll come and see you play but i'll have you over for dinner i'll cook you a nice meal and we'd love to we'll come over the night before 
if that's for cool. Sure. That would be amazing. I'll bring I'll bring the band guys. Thank you for being part of our little set of fire. We have a new song coming out called Set of Fire, and, and you did a video for it. So thank you. I know a lot of people are Back like, what? Cool. Yes. Yeah. Very cool. That was cool. Yeah. Appreciate it. All right. I'll let you go. Right, Peace. Thanks so much. Be well, my friend. You too. Take care. All right. Thanks for taking the time. Thanks to my guest, Chris Nyland, for uh, being on Legendary Life. Go check him out. Set a Fire by MXPX is out right now. Go listen. That's what Chris would want you to do. At some point, we're going to come to Montreal because I got to go to dinners at Chris's house. It's going to be amazing. I can't wait. He's a great cook. I've been watching his social media. Great cook. So, MXPX.com. We got new merch. Set a fire. Go add it. And wherever you listen to music, add it to your music library. Go watch the video. It was made right here in Bremerton, on the streets, in the warehouse, all over the place. <laughs> we had a good time with it. I hope you enjoy it. Um, if you haven't already subscribed to the MXPX YouTube channel, please do it because we've been doing live streams as well and you just want to be there so you get that little notification. Boom, MXPX is live. All right? Shout out to Bob McKnight for producing and doing just being himself. He's a great guy. I love him. And I love you. Thanks for listening. Have a great night, great day, great life. Peace.